Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Lucy and I'll be leading you today in this workshop. I am an artist and activist and human being and thank you for joining me in Art and Acceptance. So over the next half an hour I'm going to be taking you on a journey through trauma and art and acceptance. And this is going to be worked in with some drawing and poetry exercises to get you all creating with me, which I would love. And normally, of course, I'd be leading this workshop in person, but we've, of course, all learnt to adapt. And that's what we're going to be doing today. And it's going to be just as brilliant. So I want to say a huge thank you to Rising Arts Agency and the Arnold Feeney. I know how much we're all missing galleries right now and art and it's just so so nice that we can all experience exhibitions such as A Picture of Health and Joe Spencer's From Fairy Tales to Phototherapy online. I think that these wellbeing workshops are such a brilliant way to continue much needed conversations around mental health and today I guess I'd love if you could start thinking about your own picture of health and what that means. I myself has have had a very colourful past with my mental health and it's something I struggle with most days still to this day. So when I was asked if I would be interested in taking part I was dubious because I'm in no way a mental health expert or an art therapist but what I am is an expert in myself and my experience and my truth and my trauma and I guess that is what I'm here to share with you today. So yeah, let's all try and embrace the space we're in. Um, I think it's important to say that, again, if I was leading this workshop in person, I'd let you know that I really want to create a safe space here. And I will be talking about some triggering, triggering topics such as cancer and racism. <clears throat> So do what you need to do during this session, but everything still applies to this online session. If you need to take a break, please do it. If you need some time away, absolute no judgment, please do it. I'd love you all to be involved in the activities, but if it's too much, I completely understand and just join in as much as you can. And I guess the joy of this being online is that you can watch this in your own time. So yeah, take care and look after yourselves during this. And well, actually that's just a general good rule for life. Take care and look after yourselves. <laughs> so art has provided humans with a way to visually express themselves since the beginning of time. It is so powerful and we can celebrate triumph through it and simultaneously display trauma. But for me, it was when I was diagnosed with a really rare form of cancer in my early 20s, which is when I realised how much art and creativity could be used to save lives. And I guess this was really my first formal introduction in using art to help heal my trauma. I was having treatment at this amazing centre and I'd go there every day and there was this amazing woman there called Pam who is a lifelong friend now but she was the centre's resident art therapist and every day it was sort of just outside like the waiting room. Every day she'd be there. <clears throat> Every day there'd be a new project that she would gently encourage the patients to engage with. And I remember the love and I remember the care that she put into art projects and into us. And I began to look forward to going to the treatment centre. 
and it was for the art, it was for Pam. I think even then, I knew that by creating, that my voice was, it was being heard. She taught us to communicate through something other than words. And it became a lifeline truly for me in my darkest times. From patients as young as five years old, she was able to guide us and help us work through the trauma of cancer whilst having treatment. And I'd go home exhausted and in pain and generally just found it really hard to communicate unless it was through creating and art. So after treatment, I had to relearn who I was. I had to come to terms with my developing identity and I chose to do that through art. I think that's why I found Joe Spencer's work so powerful. And it was not just because of the cancer parallels, but because like her, I was using art to address the trauma. And as she herself put it, to articulate the un unrepresentable. I too felt so powerless at certain times. One particular piece of Spencer's called Being Told I Had Cancer, which way to turn. When I was looking at those photos, it just brought me instantly to tears because through those three photographs, I could feel the pain. I could feel the confusion. I could feel the questioning, the powerlessness. I could feel it all. And I think that Spence was communicating to me through those photos without having to say a word, without any literal words down. I felt so many emotions and that's the most powerful thing that I think art can do for you. I didn't know that my creative outlet for me, and at the time that was painting, it was healing and reframing my world for me. And I think that's when acceptance started to truly begin for me. So I recently was able to sit down with my amazing friend Pam and talk about everything from my time at the Proton Center and her career as an art therapist to how to truly use art and how it can begin to transform and heal lives. So I am proud to introduce my brilliant friend and artist and all round amazing person, an artist in residence at UF Health Proton Therapy Institute in Jacksonville, Florida, Pamela Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my friend. Thank you so much for being here and chatting with me today. It's so great to catch up and speak with you. My so let's, yes, do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. I ha have been an artist my entire life in one way or another, from being a graphic artist and an illustrator and an art director and a creative director and a copywriter I also taught painting in the women's prison and the men's prison. And I taught creative writing there as well, which was really a, an amazing ex experience. Um, and I rode a motorcycle for 20 years. That was a really fun, adventurous thing. I've jumped out of airplanes, uh, but mostly from my early memories, it's been art. And I was lucky enough to always do it in some way or another. Oh gosh, you're so amazing, Pam. I love all that. And you've thrown yourself out of planes as well and you ride motorcycles. What can't you do? Oh well, I'm sure. 
I lead a pretty quiet life these days. I know, I know. Um, so how did you get into your brilliant work at the Institute? Oh, you know, that was just, just the universe and luck and being in the right place at the right time mm -hmm. where every job, every art job, every creative job I ever had all came together to, to have all the skills I needed to be able to teach cancer patients and their families mm -hmm. art projects. And the goal was always to reduce stress and crises mm -hmm. to a group of people that were beyond stress and crises. Mm -hmm. And art was the way to deal with their trauma in positive ways that really helped mm -hmm. and, and made them forget for a little while what was going on. Um, just really, I was lucky is what it comes down to. It was the job of my lifetime. It really was. Oh, you'll be back there soon, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And for people like me who were actually having treatment there, I think, I don't know how much time I actually spent at the table with you, but I feel that I was more inspired afterwards. I think I, I don't know. I think at the time I didn't know how much art could heal me. And I took it for granted a little bit. I would go home after treatment and if I was up for it, I would do painting and I was inspired, but I didn't know how much like that act of doing it and being creative and putting my mind into something else was so healing. I think I'm only just realizing it now in the, in the yeah. last few years, which is really interesting, but yeah, you're amazing. Well, we, your family and I had a commitment to each other that we would do things together and then they would go home and try to get you involved. So that was our, always our goal, it was a secret goal, but we were, we were always trying to send projects home with, with your mom and with Hannah so that you maybe when you felt okay, you could do a little bit. So that was our secret goal always to get you involved somehow. Um, most patients oftentimes don't feel like they wanna do anything until maybe towards the end of their treatment. Yeah. And so my job often was to deal with siblings mm -hmm. and, to, and to calm siblings down because they're, not really getting the attention. They're just as traumatized. Yeah. They're not getting the attention from parents, uh, understandably so. Mm -hmm. And parents, you know, moms and dads and aunts and uncles would sit with me um, as, the, as the treatment time went by for their family member. But that was my goal was to, to calm the whole family down, mm -hmm. to to give extra attention to the children that were the, the siblings that weren't getting what they needed. So um, I took great pleasure in trying to help the whole family and be very holistic in what I did. And the choices of projects that I chose often had to do with who the groups were um, in my immediate time frame, And so how that program worked, in case you probably don't even know, but I would get there in the early morning and I would stay all day, 10 hours a day. Um, and it would just be an open table. Yeah. And so I had to have projects that everybody could do because I had people sit with me from one years old, a Korean child that didn't speak English that was one all the way to 90 year olds yeah. and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to have projects that solve those problems of the main question that I would put out was, do you even like art? Because a lot of people would say, I'm terrible. I'm yeah. terrible. I'm not gonna sit with you because I'm yeah. bad at it. Interesting and, question um, to ask. Yes. So 
that was getting past that bias that people have about themselves, that they're really bad. So my projects were all also designed to help everybody have success, even if they thought they were terrible. Because everybody does. They think they're terrible at art, unless they're a practicing artist. And even then, we all have yeah. our, our insecurities, <laughs> yeah. don't we? <laughs> yeah, oh, 100%. That's so true. That's so true. Yeah. And I like that you made it open. And that was like, it's such a calming approach. You're not, you're just, I don't know, you're just open and welcoming and you create that, I don't know, that environment that is safe and yeah, makes it easy to go and engage, I suppose, in like a horrible environment. Yeah, people never expected it. Um, and they never expected to allow themselves to be as vulnerable as they got doing artwork. And, and what I would often share, which I'll share with you, is that art can, in the, in the field of medicine, can do so much even to reduce, reducing the amount of medicine you need to take if you're engaging in art. Um, reducing your stress, obviously, and your, and your, uh, your feelings of anxiety. Um, it can reduce hospital stays because you feel better if you're doing art every day. Yeah. Um, it just has a myriad of really good effects, lowering your blood pressure. Yeah. I taught a, a class, I often taught workshops at lunchtime at the Proton Institute. They would ask me, and there would be a hundred people there, and my task was to do an art project with a hundred people, which is not always easy to do. But one time, a woman came to me afterwards and she said, I did your project. I'm not an artistic person. I love doing it. But the biggest thing is I immediately went downstairs and had my blood pressure taken. My doctor's been trying to reduce my blood pressure and we couldn't get it down. And when I went downstairs and had my blood pressure checked after your workshop, it was lower. Wow. And I just wanted to cry. Yes. <laughs> so it does have physical effects and people want to dismiss that you know if they're not involved in art but yeah. it really does have um medical effects that are positive right in front of your eyes as well you could see that her blood oh, yeah. had gone down yeah that's amazing yeah, it's, really, it's so it's really healing great. isn't it it's so healing yeah. um but yeah so what is a very hard question but how do you think trauma and art relate well, having been a traumatized person in my younger life, <laughs> I can say that there's a lot of shame and repression and um, inward holding back of feelings when you're, you've been traumatized. Mm -hmm. And art helps to release those things. Mm -hmm. Art gives you another kind of words that you might not be able to use verbally, but will will you can use with paint, you know, you can use with color, or you know, you can get anger out with brush strokes. Yes. <laughs> and so yeah, that's I think is critical that we use more art with more trauma patients because it gives you words. Mm. You know, and, and it can be beautiful when you're what it and it it could be meaningless. You can throw it away when you're done. Yeah. But the process is what matters. That's and right. most people don't think about that. They think about, oh, the end product, somebody's gonna see my bad art. But yeah. it's the process of going through your your mindset and, and your feelings yeah. and, and the actual trauma that you've endured. Get it out. You know, you have yeah. to just get it. And art helps you get it out. Yeah, that's so true just get it out onto the paper or the wall or whatever your canvas is. Um, exactly. I've definitely found that when I couldn't express myself that I have done through art. Um, yeah, because words are so difficult sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But art is, is, it doesn't have to be. But I think you're right because we do get stuck on like, oh, I'm not an artist, oh, it's it's horrible I don't like the drawing when it's not about the actual creation you're right it's the process like mm -hmm. it's the journey and mm -hmm. 
It's so interesting. I'm learning so much every day about it. It is, and just keep doing it. You know, um, I think it was, hold on, let me see who it was. It was, I have all my, my research right here. Amazing. I have a, a really good quote I used to say in my workshops from Vincent van Gogh. And he said, um, if you hear the little voice inside you that says, I cannot paint, then indeed paint and prove that voice wrong. Yeah, don't you love that? Yes, I love that, I love that so much. I love yeah. that because it's true. You know, you everybody tells themselves they can't do it or they're not good at it or it's not going to come out right. Mm. But if you do it anyway, yeah, you prove that voice wrong. Yes, prove that voice wrong. And you're right; no one ever has to see it. <laughs> yeah. It's oh, just I just for you. Oh, me too. <laughs> me too. And even I can even look at stuff I've done that I hate looking at, but I enjoy it because I know at the time that was me getting something out. It was me expressing myself or telling a story right. or whatever it was. So I can enjoy it a little bit more, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think you're right. And and oftentimes I think people are um bogged down with getting it, getting what the artist wanted them to get. And one of the things I did at the Proton Institute was hang an art show every three months. We had an art show hanging um, of different things that we would do. Yeah. And I would get employees and moms and dads and whoever would look at the artwork on the wall and, and not get it. And I say, you know, it's not really for you to get, you know, it's not for you to get. All you have to do is like, do you like that brush stroke? Do you like that color combination? Mm. You know, is what does it say to you? Mm. Make your own meaning for it because the artist is long gone. He's done it. She's done it already. Yeah. You know, they did it for themselves, whatever it meant for them. And they did it. So now part of having an art project is having an audience. Mm. So you guys are the audience mm. and you have to get out of it what you get out of it. It doesn't, you don't have to know what the artist wanted you to get. Yeah. And that's just my feeling, but I feel that way. Yeah, it's so true. And I think sometimes like when you're using art to heal or therapy or trauma, whatever it is, um, you don't know, you might not know what you're getting out of it like you might not know what you're drawing you might not know what you're trying to get out of it yourself and that's okay like mm -hmm. that yeah. we need to be okay with that and to tell others that's fine just go with it I think because I had a little one girl one time and I'll never forget her I still stay in touch with her mother she was a sibling she was not a patient and she was doing some artwork and she just really didn't like it. She said, you know, I just made a big mistake and I just really hate this. And I said, well, good. If you hate it, then we might as well just keep going because <laughs> you already hate it. You're not going to, you know, let's see what else we could do on top of it. And by the time she was done, she loved her artwork, but I didn't allow her to stop. Yeah. You know, we, she hated it. We all, at some point, you know, we don't like what we're doing. Yeah probably and just keep going just keep you know going. you can't mess it up if you already hate it no right? I love it. <laughs> it'll get any worse <laughs> right if you if you don't like it it can't get worse yeah so let's keep going with it I love that what a metaphor for <laughs> life as well just keep going yep <laughs> you just why not going why not <laughs> so true <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh um and let me look at my question sheet so yeah so how can somebody get started using art I guess to heal from trauma that is so easy and in my book that I showed you um the very first page involves scribbling you can just scribble you know, scribble with your eyes closed. And this is a project I often would do on the first day of some new patients arriving. 
um, to get past that feeling that they were bad at mm -hmm. art. Scribble using your non-dominant hand. Mm -hmm. um, scribble lightly and then fill in spaces with other colors. Mm -hmm. Just scribbling makes it be in kind of non-representational. Mm -hmm. And, and you're using your body to move, which is important. And you just go where your hand takes you. Yeah. And um, and then add to that scribble yeah. by looking in there to see if there's any kind of um, creature or mm. shape that you see that you like. And then add color and add patterns. And that to me is the easiest way to just start. Get a piece of paper and a pencil. Yeah. You don't need anything other than that and scribble away. <laughs> just go for it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that's the project I have in, in my book, I have um, from there, I went to a more um, sophisticated doodling which is Zentangle, which we might have done when you were there. I have a bunch of Zentangle things. Amazing. Here. Like, kind of like that. Yes, is a I love those. And yeah, I, I used to sit and do them um, for the last several months after they shut the art program down. I was the policeman at the front door of Proton, making <laughs> sure no one was ill when they came in. So I would take temperatures. I would sit there for five hours and I would zentangle all day long. And then when people commented on it, I would just give it to them. And they, they were, it was so fun to be able to have something to give away. Yeah. Or, you know, sit there all day. Yeah. So that, that's what I did. Oh, that's brilliant. And it's so true, just something so small as, well, not small, but I guess can be seen as simple as a pen and paper. Just mm -hmm. go for it. You can start, yeah. you can start today. And it doesn't have to be representational. That's the thing that always just stumps people. They think they have to be realistic. So none of my projects were ever about realism. Even portraits, we did, often we would, we have done portraits um, of each other or of just a random face or their own face. And we would do it in the style of, for example, Picasso, where you have two eyes over here and a nose over here, or we would do it in the style of Modigliani mm -hmm. and it's long and drawn out and it's little almond eyes and a long nose. Yeah. And um, people could do that and they liked it and, and they felt accomplished yeah. that they did face, but it wasn't a realistic face. Yeah. But it kind of, if you look at Modigliani, he's kind of realistic, but yeah, I think so. in a way that is perfect. You know, we have camera phones for that, yeah. <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> That's a good idea as well, because it takes some of the pressure off and it can be a bit silly and yeah. light and playful as well. Exactly. That's why I did the things that I did was to try to remove that stigma of mm. perfection, which yeah. when, little, when you're a child, everybody draws and does artwork as children. And it seems to stop around eight or nine. And my personal th theory is that little kids look inwards they survive by being inward and at that certain age eight nine ten they start looking out at yeah. the world and they start seeing well my tree doesn't look like that tree outside so my tree must not be good mm. or whatever they compare their artwork with reality yeah. and they don't match reality so they unless they're really really into art they stop yeah and a lot of people just stop doing art yeah my goal is to not do anything realistic. Uh, no. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so my, the title of my workshop will be called, no, let me start that again. The title of my workshop is Art and Acceptance. And I think that art helped me accept my new situation, I suppose, and who I was after cancer. 
because I was a different person and I didn't know I was going to be a different person. And I think when I came back from treatment, I really fought against that, especially. I wanted to like get back to my normal life and just see my friends and all the stuff I was doing before. And I couldn't do that. Um, and so I think art helped me accept, yeah, my new position in life, who I was. And I grew to like that person. It took a while to learn who she was. And yeah, but it helped me accept me. So my question to you is, what do you think that art has helped you accept? Ooh, good question. (laughs) (laughs) Throw it in there at the end. Yeah, that's a tough one. I think probably the biggest thing it helped me accept is that my artwork is mine. It doesn't have to look like famous people's artwork Mm. there's value in it that it's mine and that's really a hard thing to give yourself is that value um we all think we're kind of a little bit less than perfect and good and right and talented and so art doing art and i have done honestly since i was my earliest memories since probably three years old always have done it in some capacity but having a style was always very difficult for me and I think that's because I could do anything but I didn't know what my artwork was and so as I got older I learned what my artwork was and living life helped me to see what my expression was Mm. and I think that's what I got from art the most is learning about myself and myself and not being you know the kind of artist that other people are you know I have a couple favorites here locally and I just think I could never do that (laughs) but that doesn't mean that what I do is any less than what they do absolutely that's a big step it Mm. was a big step for me and um, and I think that the Proton Institute helped me to achieve that. Mm. Too. Oh, yeah, I'm glad it's amazing. Um, well, thank you so much, Pam, for being here today oh. and answering my questions. I love you so much, and you are incredible. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. You've done, you're, I just love watching every new step that you take. And I'm so happy that you're involved in this project. Mm. And you have so much to give because of your history mm. and, and what you've gone through as a strong Black woman. I love all of that for you. And I just love seeing every new artwork that you do. And I look forward to more. Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you. So as Pam mentioned, the easiest way to get started using art to heal is just to start. So I would like to join me in our first activity, which is just going to be some light drawing. So all you're going to need to begin is some pens and paper, um, or whatever material you feel comfortable using, it might be paint or chalk or charcoal, whatever it is, please feel free to use. Um, You might wanna stick to something you know or try something new. Both are brilliant. So what I would like you to do is to get three sheets of paper and I'm gonna give you 15 minutes for this activity. So that's about five minutes per piece of paper. Now, remember, it's not about what it's going to look like on the paper, and you don't have to show anyone, it is about the process. So, during these five minutes, I want you to draw freely. Whatever your hand wants to do on that page is correct. However, you want to express yourself is the correct way. Now it could be shapes or squiggly lines, doodles, perhaps it's words and drawings, 
As I said, there's no right or wrong way to express yourself during this. And remember drawing as a child when there was like no rules and we weren't afraid of judgment and we were free. And it's really sad we lose that somewhere along the way. And I think it's a great quality to have. So on your first piece of paper, I want you to spend five minutes with your pen or whatever you're using to doodle or depict a time when you remember feeling happy. Drawing on those emotions of pleasure and joy and lightness, whatever you feel, I guess, really, when you felt happy. So on your second piece of paper, I want you to spend five minutes expressing a time you felt unhappy. So whatever those feelings, whatever those emotions bring up when you think of being unhappy, I would love you to just spend five minutes and just let, just see what see what your hand does on that paper. Remember again there's no right or wrong and you don't have to show anyone so just don't worry about it. And so on the third piece of paper I'd love you to spend five minutes depicting how you feel right now, how you feel at this moment in time, whatever that feeling is, try and put that down on the piece of paper. Now, alternatively, if you come to the end of the five minutes on any of the pieces of paper and you feel like you haven't had enough time to express yourself or you don't feel ready to move on, then please don't. Like, if you're really into it and it's getting you somewhere, just carry on with whatever you're doing because, yeah, you might be expressing something or exploring your emotion or you might just really be enjoying what you're doing right now, then yeah, just please go for it because this is about you after all. So I tried this last week and I just set myself five minutes and I was in a particularly good mood that day so I thought I'll channel this and yeah, I'm gonna just let my pencil do whatever it needs to do on the paper. So I set my timer for five minutes and after five minutes what I produced was in no way a masterpiece and that's good because that's not the point, it's about the process of what I was doing and when I looked down on the page I think it was all like flowers and I think I had done like a lot of ticks, like checks because I don't know, I must have been feeling myself that day or my work or something because I was just checking things off. But again, it was about the process. It was about taking five minutes for myself to express myself and that was me showing myself self-care. It's me taking time out to explore and express myself in a simple and really accessible way. So if you have access to a timer, that would be amazing. And I guess I'd like you to set five minutes. And then when that five minutes is up, another five minutes, and then your last five minutes. So we will begin the 15 minute drawing activity now. Have fun. Welcome back and thank you so much for joining me in that. And before I move on, I guess I just want to take a few moments for you guys to reflect on that activity. Asking yourself, how did that make you feel? Did you find it more easy or difficult? Would you try that again? And I know for me, sometimes it's easy to reflect a few hours later or a few days later 
So if that's the case for you, I'd love to hear how you found that. The overwhelming sense of trauma and unparalleled sadness hit me again in a huge way back in last year with the killing of George Floyd, who was just one of many black people who have been killed due to racism. And I felt my depression was really woken up again. I was finding media and my social media was flooded with brutal images, descriptions and videos of ordinary people who look like me, got my nose, got my hair, they were dying and that's what it felt like was happening to me all over again. My mind was consumed with these painful images and I was finding it hard to breathe most days let alone express myself verbally and I was feeling those feelings of being stunted and unable to communicate. There were times when I was feeling voiceless and hopeless and the worst thing I think was that it was a really familiar feeling. But sadly, I am used to be un underrepresented in society and the media and in most sectors generally actually. Growing up I wasn't seeing myself anywhere, not in the pages of magazines, movies, even closer to home at school. I wasn't seeing people who looked like me. I've grown up with that sadly as the norm and I'm 28. I found that being in lockdown definitely wasn't helping either. Either The amount of time spent on my phone, endlessly scrolling social media, was negatively affecting me. And perhaps we all have an idea of how that feels. I was scrolling down Instagram and I could go for minutes without seeing any black people any black faces, any black bodies, black art, generally just black content. I wasn't seeing any black writers and I really began to think about this and I began, began to message accounts, especially fashion brands, asking them what their policies on inclusion and representation are. And I guess I was straight up asking at some point, so I was just so frustrated, I'd literally just send a message saying like, where are the black people? And I'd usually get the, the standard corporate company line back thanking me for my message and they'll be sure to pass on my feedback. But that was just not good enough for me anymore. But I began to think and... I guess I began to create again and I'm drawing parallels with Jo Spencer's work again because during her phototherapy she found it was so effective in expressing repressed thoughts and feelings and I had experienced what painting especially had done for me before and after treatment and so once again I turned to art. I began to illustrate bodies and faces, just generally people that I wanted to see. I began to draw and draw and draw and I thought, if brands aren't going to feature black models, well let me put some into the world. What am I missing? Let me put that out there into the world. and. There was so much joy and healing in that, in creating, just creating. And I was 
yeah, I was regaining control of my narrative and changing what I didn't like. And as I said, I began to feel inspired again. I began to feel joy and yeah, I think there's something really special about feeling a moment of joy in amongst all the trauma. It was helping drawing and putting something out into the world again, it was helping. The art making process once again was helping me heal physically, mentally and emotionally. And I think that releasing these beautiful black bodies back into the world felt like a sort of safe expression. Sonia Boyce talks about the legacy of trauma and her work is about questioning the representation of black women and that's what I feel is, that's what I was doing through my illustrations. I was questioning society as to why black women especially, are so misrepresented and unrepresented. Transgenerational trauma is a very real thing and I wanted to demonstrate to future generations and even my future children I wanted to show them an abundance, like a wealth of black bodies and black art and black truth, black love, just all the black excellence I was missing. I was able to turn an immeasurable pain into something beautiful and purposeful. And once again, I think that really was the power of art. So the next activity I'd love for you to join me in is a short poetry exercise. And again, this is just for you. So please don't panic thinking, I'm not a poet. I can't do this. I know you can. And it's more about the process anyway. Plus, who knows, you might even be a poet, and you didn't know. So I'm not so worried about the structure or the line length or anything like that. It is just, it's more about the content. So I want you to use the next 15 minutes to write an ode. So an ode is a poem especially one that is written in praise of a particular person, thing or event. But now here comes your challenge. So I want you to write this ode, this praise about something you don't like or aren't fond of. So it could be a particular food you don't enjoy or perhaps a place that you've been, that you didn't have a good time in, or even a person that you just don't really gel with. But what we're gonna do, and this is the challenge, is this ode is gonna be something positive. We're gonna write something positive and something constructive and something kind about that thing that you aren't fond of. So the object of this activity is to take something negative and make something beautiful and positive out of it. And I mean, I don't want you to lie to yourselves and <laughs> write about this food and pretend it's so amazing and it's the most delicious thing you've ever eaten suddenly. But I want you to find, try and find and see if there's anything positive about it. I want you to see that beauty and the creativity and positivity, it can all be found anywhere, even if it doesn't feel like it at the time. 
your poem is going to be the something beautiful that you've created out of something ugly, which is going to be the thing that you don't like. So yeah, this might be challenging or it might come to you instantly, but yeah, please stick with it and I'm going to be doing it too and yeah, just bring on a challenge. So once again, we're going to set the 15 minute timer and yeah, have fun. So that is your 15 minutes up. Thank you so much for joining me in that activity. I know that's not an easy one, but I think it's really great to challenge yourself sometimes. So yeah, how did that make you feel? I know I struggle with that one because it's easy, or I find it easy, for your mind to go negative and go to negative places and I find it easier to write in anger. <laughs> so yeah, pushing myself to write something positive like that is a challenge and yeah, just well done to us. So we're coming to the end of our workshop but I wanted to end on a meditation because I know how hard talking or hearing or even thinking about trauma can be and as much as it's amazing and really important to have these conversations it can be also really hard to sit in it so I thought a really nice way to end the session would be if you joined me in a meditation so I'm gonna actually turn my camera off now and that way I think we can just have a little more focus. So it doesn't matter if you've never done meditation before or if you've done it before, that's amazing. Either's great. Um, I'm just happy that you could be open with me today and yeah, let's see what happens. So today we're really gonna focus on recognizing any resistance that comes to us while we're doing this and um, we're not going to be judging it we're just going to be recognizing so it's just about noticing and our aim here is to see the mind clearly so take a few moments to get comfortable where you're sitting and i want you to have open eyes and a soft focus you're aware of the space around you and begin to take some deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. Next time you exhale, just close your eyes and allow the breath to return to its natural rhythm. Becoming more aware now of the physical senses and again, noticing any resistance. We're not judging, just noticing. So bringing your attention back to the body and you're becoming more aware of the weight of your body where you're sitting. 
Do you feel comfortable? Uncomfortable? Noticing any sounds around you. Feel the points of contact. It might be the hands resting on the legs. Perhaps it's your feet on the floor. Are you resisting? We're not judging, just noticing. So checking in with the body, seeing how it's feeling and take the next minute or so to scan down your body. And remember, if your mind wanders, that's absolutely fine. Just bring it back. And what is the emotional tone of your mind? What do you think acceptance could do for you? Now, bringing your attention back to the breath. How is your breathing? Are your intakes short? Maybe they're longer? Is each breath the same or are they slightly different? But we are just focusing on the rising and falling of the body. And I want you to ask yourself the question, what can I begin to accept right now? What can I stop resisting? And remember, if your mind wanders, it's absolutely fine. Just bring it back to those questions. What can I begin to accept right now? What can I stop resisting? Now you're not judging whatever comes up from that question. You're just recognizing it and letting it go.
Focusing on the rise and the fall of the breath. Now allow the mind to let go of any focus and let the mind wander, let it do whatever it wants to do. Now bring your attention back to your body, back to the feeling of your weight on the floor or your seat, wherever you're sat. And begin to notice any sounds or smells around you. And now gently open your eyes. But before you begin to move, I want you to notice how you feel. Notice if you felt any resistance there. Were you able to let go of anything? And remember, it's not about judging those thoughts. It's just about recognizing and noticing and letting it go. So thank you so much for joining me with that. I know that felt good for me. Um, it can feel a little strange, but I think it's good to get yourself sort of out of that headspace that we were in previously. So yeah just thank you so much for trusting me with that and allowing me to take you on that journey of meditation so we have come to the end of our workshop and i just want to thank every single one of you for joining me and for be being open to listening to someone else's account of trauma a huge thank you to everyone at Rising Arts Agency and a huge thank you to Arnold Feeney for not only letting me host a workshop but for also just putting on an amazing exhibition. Thank you so much, I have been Lucy and this has been Art and Acceptance.